10-year-old company, which makes aircraft engines and stuff that, uh, you know, fly in planes. He makes power generation turbines, so land-based, which generates power for all of us. And then they also make many other things, which I'm not going to talk about today, but they're all from the aeronautics, uh, aeros aeronautics. So I think what I'm going to be talking about is uh, some of the, uh, to give you a perspective, you may all be doing CFD, you may be learning um, you know, mechanical design for aerospace components. So I'm going to be talking, I'm a metallurgist, I have a master's and a PhD in metallurgical engineering and materials. You might have learned strength of metals in the second year, right? Yes. Which you might have all hated and run away. But uh, no, you liked it? Excellent. So I'm going to talk to you about what are the materials because ultimately Everything is, because everything material is there, you're able to design, right? Whatever you design on paper or on ANSYS, uh, whatever heat flow you do, some material has to take it, only then you can put it into practice in the structural engineering world. So I think, uh, thank uh, Professor Sanjil Kumar for inviting me here. And I'm going to give you a perspective of what are the kind of materials that are used in both aero engines as well as power generation gas turbines. So both these are, you can <coughs> interchange both. Uh, there's a lot of, uh, what can I say, there's a lot of desire to think of aircraft engines because it flies up in the air, it's more attractive. Uh, but it doesn't matter, both that ultimately everything is a gas turbine. So, so if you go to the next slide. Um, so what I've shown here is a gas turbine on the right, right hand side. And what we were told when we were studying many, many years ago is, the entire four-year BE program of mechanical engineering, aerospace engineering, electrical engineering, and metallurgical engineering uh, can be taught using the single engineering masterpiece. Uh, if you take a cross section of this, if you come to our, uh, if you come to GE, we have uh, what is called an open uh, session. So where we tear up this component completely, it's called a tear down lab, and then we take engineers through the training. So the entire four years, what you learn in college can just be taught using this single piece. All the engineering is associated with what we learn in textbooks is there in this beautiful masterpiece. Now I'm going to refer to one of the most, according to me, what is the most significant innovation of the previous century. Uh, we are in the next century now, on top of the previous century. What would you say? Any of you? Somebody else, but computer, before computer, something else preceded it, right? So I'm talking of true innovation uh, in the real sense. I see is your internal combustion engine or integrated circuits? Integrated circuits, yeah, but silicon moves long and all that. Anybody from this side with a different answer, maybe? The girls? What, what do you think is the most? Uh, you're doing engineering, right? Ultimately, inventions have been there. We are now sending rockets uh, to the moon and space. They said the silicon industry or the Silicon Valley, according to them, this site is the most innovative thing of the previous century. Yeah, okay, let's give them a chance. Okay. Something, one invention. Come on. Too early in the morning, is it? No? You don't want to think a little bit? Peter. Huh? Pager. What is? Pager, Pager. Pager. Okay. We are talking about the invention level. That way you think even a knife is an invention. It is made of stainless steel. So, no, that's good. But, uh, some, okay, according to me, 1903 and the Wright brothers, that is my perspective. You can all have different, that's why I asked you. To me, 1903, the Wright brothers and the flying machine is one of the most significant inventions which has revolutionized modern transport. Do you agree with me? Yes, they look up and when they went on a plane, somebody from the back is supporting my uh, thought. So um, today, it's 100 years, 110 years, hence when we're looking at the same invention, we are talking, the other day I was in a, wait, even yesterday when I came by flight here, somebody was saying, why can't we go from Bangalore to Chennai in 30 seconds? It took 30 minutes. People don't have the patience today. And about like, two years ago, it was, uh, or very recently when I was going from 
bang you to New York. They say why? Why? The, why does it take so long? 24 hours stop over somewhere. Why can't we go straight in three hours? So what is that? Today we are talking of high-speed civilian transport. When the Wright brothers did it, doing a 30-minute flight was an achievement, right? And how is it possible? Because people, young minds like you are able to do newer designs. They are able to design combustion. They are able to design fluid flow. They are able to design mechanically the structure, the load bearing capability. <coughs> you have to excuse me. I have a bad throat. Um, so and then how does how does uh, how do they actually put what they design on the FEM model or on paper to actual practice? It is because of materials. So I'm going to be focusing because I'm a metallurgist. I'm going to entirely give you a perspective of what are the gas turbine components, what materials they made of, how revolutions were made in the last, uh, you know, maybe 60 years, I'm not going to go back 100 years ago, and more recently what we are doing in this, including additive manufacturing, which many of you would have heard as a buzzword, I think you have uh, some additive manufactured machines in your, uh, in your research park here, and I'll also give you a perspective of how these are manufactured, okay? Completely different from what you're studying, so... So, let's, let's be honest. So, when, um, when we talk of aero engines, there is two common buzzwords. That is, one is hotter and one is lighter. Lighter because for aircraft engines, anything that is light is going to be able to enable a much better specific fuel consumption and thrust. So, for the same amount of fuel that is there, if the body of the aircraft is, you know, one half um, its weight now, and I am talking specifically of the engine, not the aircraft itself, because today the aircraft, if you look at an aeroplane, it is made of aluminum, it is made of carbon fiber reinforced composites, it is made of some things which are very, very light, density of less than one, people are striving towards that. But when you're talking of such components, then how will it, what are the mechanical properties? Will it be able to withstand the same strength? I mean, I'm sure you're all doing some kind of design projects. You would have, even the chair that you're sitting, so, so we people can sit, let's say up to 100, 150 kilograms it can hold. If an elephant comes and sits on it, will it hold? The same cross-sectional area with this thickness? No, is it? That's, that's the kind of thing I'm talking about. So how do, we, how do we look at things which are lighter? That is number one. The second thing is hotter. Because higher the temperature, you're going to have a greater uh, heat input to turn the turbine blades and then which will turn heat energy into mechanical energy. That mechanical energy becomes a thrust to be able to take it faster. Okay, so hotter and lighter is no common buzzword. So then you can't use uh, polymeric materials. You can't use aluminum. You can't. Use, what is the melting point of aluminum? Hmm? How much? Three twenty-three is probably lead that you use in solders. Aluminum is very really higher. Exactly six sixty degrees centigrade. Good. So obviously I can't use it because modern gas turbine is running at, used to be running at temperatures such as 1100 degrees C. Now at 1100 degrees C you can comb the entire periodic table and say I will use a tungsten which is used in the filament. But can I use a tungsten because when I take a glass and I put it, what happens? If I drop a glass tumbler on the floor, what will happen to it? It breaks. If I take a steel and put it on the floor, it will not break. At most it will bend. No, that's why our cars are made of mild steel panels. So, but this is at room temperature application. The temperature we are talking about here is very, very high temperatures. And you need the ductility, you need the strength. You not only need just absolute strength, you need three main factors when designers have to keep in mind when they are designing high temperature structures. Right? Not just room temperature strength if you are talking. That's why I gave you a glass of... <coughs> So, um, so we are we are designing. Okay, so, how do we design for higher temperatures? Three main things you have to keep in mind. One is what is called the time-dependent inelastic strain. What does that mean to you in common language? <coughs> it is called creep. What does creep mean? When you hang a piece of wire, lead wire, and that he mentioned 323 degrees centigrade is a melting point of aluminum, and I disagreed with him. And I said it's a lead. If I hang a piece of lead wire here with a weight of one kilogram, if I hang a piece of steel wire, we all go back and come tomorrow morning. The lead wire at this temperature today of Chennai, which is 28 degrees centigrade, 
will actually touch the ground, whereas the steel wire will remain intact. Do you know why it is? Do you remember this experiment? We've all done this in school, high school, in class six or so. That is a phenomenon called green, which even though the material is elastic, you know, you're all familiar, Young's model is proportionality limit, elastic limit. Even though we all design for it to be in the elastic limit, the material, because of the action of a load, and room temperature is high enough for the melting point of lead, which is 323 degrees, it creeps. That means it plastically deforms. Certainly we don't want that, right? When we are flying up um, in the air, we don't want high temperature materials. And the higher the temperature, the material will creep faster. It will, even though you've designed it to be in the elastic regime. So one important factor is creep. What is the second important factor? That which we all undergo all the time. Why do bridges fail? Have you ever thought about that? In the mid-70s, actually, lots and lots of bridges, huge bridges, you know, the San Francisco Golden Gate, several in China, several in the US. The civil engineers had designed excellently both hanging bridge and um, suspension bridges. And uh, they all started failing and they were major failures. Why? Loading. Resonance. Louder. Resonance. Sorry? Resonance. Yeah, OK. Good. What is it? You're good, actually. Take off on that. Who said that? Yeah, so why? why? No, no, that's OK. You can say something. Around the natural frequency is equal to that. That is the te technical definition. So why should it fail? Because amplitude, uh, like it amplifies the vibration. Of the cars more going up and up. And what is that called? I mean, the answer is in the board. Exactly. You all understand what fatigue is? I like to give this example to the most of the classes that I teach. So I am I am teaching here, and let's say I'm very health conscious, and I eat exactly the same amount every day as I work out. You know, we're all doing workouts and all that right these days to keep ourselves slim and fit. So let's say I eat exactly so much, and I exercise or work out exactly this exactly so much. Uh, do you think I'll be immortal? No, please don't say I will die because I'm in no hurry to die, but. Do you think anybody can be immortal if we balance the input and output? Yes or no? Why? What's that? Louder? What loss? No, but why? Why should there be? That is only in Kano's efficiency. But I'm going to eat exactly as much as I exercise out in a whole day. I burn so many kilocalories, I eat. Hmm? Now, what real process are you talking about? What, what process? Please specify. I mean, I'm talking to you here. Not heat, I'm talking about you and you and them and me and. Anybody else can think of what? We're not talking about heat transfer processes, right? We're talking about human beings and say that if we exercise exactly amount and the answer is in what I'm not talking on a philosophy class here. So we're talking with respect to fatigue. So that is a clue there. So in the interest of time, I'm going to, uh, uh, some, sometimes it helps to give Latin examples, sometimes it confuses further. So what I'm going to tell you is that um, even though you do that, what he called as resonance vibrations, which I would like to call as fatigue, is inherent in anything in life. So let me give an example. Here I'm talking to you, I'm going to be talking for the next two hours with a sore throat. And then maybe I'll be quiet the next three hours because I've, you know, I've you know, out, outreached my voice. And then after that, I'm going to be screaming to another set of students for another two hours. So what am I doing here? In the whole day, even though I may be exactly exercising exactly amount as I eat or number of kilocalories, I'm not doing the same thing. It's not the same line. So the amplitude that he liked to explain is not a theoretical thing that happens every day in our lives. So when the people designed the bridges, they were very, very clever civil engineers and architects. They des designed for a particular load-bearing capability of the bridges for say, let's say 10,000 cars in a day. But what they forgot in a 50 year time frame is that on the weekdays, there will be maybe 12,000 cars in a day on, you know, from let's say nine to five. On the weekends, there may be only 2,000 cars from 9 to 5. So if you, if you plot the entire load-bearing capability, even though their maximum load-bearing capability may be 20,000 cars in a day, but it is, it's going to be like this and like this, right? 
it is going to vary in a sinusoidal manner with varying amplitudes. So that entire stochastic process which we all face in life, whether it is a human being or whether it is a car or a bridge or whatever, <coughs> that phenomenon of fatigue can induce plastic deformation which will cause materials to fade. So the second point, first what did I say? High temperature materials need to be taken care of clean, which is time dependent in elastic strain. The second what did I say is fatigue, low cycle and high cycle fatigue. And the third and most important thing that aero engines face is, because they are operating at 1110,000 degrees C, is corrosion. Now what is a common example of corrosion that you can see in daily life? Rust that forms of iron. Not all materials corrode, why? Rust is a form of oxidation, right? All of you have learned that in school. If you leave a piece of steel or cast iron outside to sun and rain, what will happen? It will form rust. Rust is nothing but iron oxide. So anything on earth's crust will form oxide. And some oxides are stable, like the one on aluminum. Some oxides are not stable, like rust. It will keep breaking and forming more oxides. But the, they, that we are talking at room temperature with humidity, right? This one is high temperature, very high temperature structures are prone to corrosion. So as design engineer from uh, for an aerospace application or an aero engine application, we have to keep hotter and lighter so that the, uh, there is an increase in the specific strength, thrust and the specific fuel consumption is reduced. So from 50 years ago to today, what we've been able to achieve, we're able to take off, uh, we are able to exercise very short takeoffs and landings. They, you know, in the whole thing, we are able to fly up to 16 to 18 hours. I think the Dreamliner flies 22 hours non-stop. So imagine, 22 hours you need so much of fuel. Now if you make the material lighter, then the amount of fuel, let's say, I don't know, maybe uh, 10,000 liters, which is which can be held in the aircraft. Because if you keep adding more, then you, you know, when you go in a plane, they say don't carry more than 23 kilograms. There's a weight restriction. Why is that? Because the more you add, then it's going to be less efficient in transporting you from one place to another. So you have to keep in mind... This is the compressor, this is the blade that you see as soon as you enter a plane, you know, there's a big fan, have you ever noticed, there's a big fan blade that is typically made of titanium alloys, Ti-6-4 is a workhorse material. Yeah, and so this is the fan, this compresses the air, there is a bypass that uh, after the compression today we are able to achieve 16 is to 1, 18 is to 1, 20 is to 1, etc. And here we inject the fuel. The fuel is a compressed air burn <coughs> that goes in transit to my So typical metrics that we use is uh, this temperature, inlet temperature, there is a T3 which is the compressor exit temperature and T4, whatever, this is the turbine inlet temperature. These are two indicators for improving the gas turbine efficiency. So now if you look at this, historically I'm just showing you, in the last 40, 60 years, slowly the temperature from 900 degrees centigrade I told you today we are operating at actually 1400 to 1600 degrees centigrade. Now how is it possible? I mean in a 60 year time frame, you have really enhanced the temperature by 200 and 300 degrees centigrade. Where are the materials? Material has to withstand that, no? You might have heard uh, re sometime back there was a big space uh, spacecraft uh, accident 
and there was some Kalpana Chabra lost her life and all that, right? How did it happen? Because they had a carbon uh, tile there that was a heat shield when, uh, when the rocket left Earth's space and that shield actually came off. So there's nothing to insulate the metal there from the hot temperatures of exit from friction will take place when the aircraft is going. So you need high temperature materials to be able to withstand all these designs. And you can see here that this curve now, this is the temperature of uh, the year of introduction. This is the crust to weight ratio that I showed you in the previous slide. What you can see here is this reaching now. We are now at 2016, 20 years from this date. But you can see this curve is reaching a natural asymptote. So we don't have materials on Earth which can perform at higher and higher and higher temperatures. So what do we do? We bring in coatings. We bring in high temperature coatings to actually support and put it like a paint on a wall. We put high temperature thermal barrier coatings which are able to insulate the metal and take the gas turbine to much higher temperatures. We'll come to the coatings a little later but let me finish with this. The typical important through, uh, rules of thumb that you may be interested as an aerospace engineer is how do I increase the turbine uh, compressor outlet temperature and the turbine inlet temperature? What it says with respect to the performance indices, if you increase it by about 50 degrees, there is a 4 to 5 percent increase in the specific fuel consumption. So it's amazing, 5 percent is a huge um, game changer in terms of being able to fly, I told you, very short distances or take off and land at very short, uh, you know, like a helicopter. Today we can't do that for a gas turbine aero engine, right? The plane has to cruise, then it has to take off, up to 10,000 feet it will go, and it has to go about 30,000 feet, there it spent most of the journey, and it has to come back again, you remember? They will announce, the pilots will say, dim your lights, we are about to land and all that. Why is it? Because it goes through the cycle. Whereas in a helicopter you can take off and land like this, right? You have seen helipads in many apartments. And the other performance it is to keep in mind is another 50 degree increase in the turbine inlet temperature is going to cause you um, uh, again a 50% uh, ah. yeah. so, this, so these are two important rules of thumbs that you would uh, okay. Okay, so um, so this is, but what is happening, as I said, this is reaching a natural lesson from here in 2016, okay, this is 1996, and uh, so we need to be very, very innovative in using all our skills to maximize the design, to maximize the aerodynamics, and to maximize the, and optimize the material selection. So, what is next? So what I'm showing here is a latest G90 engine. Maybe afterwards, if you get time over the weekend, you can Google this. It's quite a fascinating. This is what runs our dream, Dreamliner. Look at what it is. In 1955, the turbine exit temperature somewhere here. So this is the fan that you see, and then this is these are all the compressor stages. Obviously, you can't see them, but what you see when you see outside is this. Um, all these are going to compress the air, and this is where the air and the fuel will mix, so you will have fuel lines passing. This hot gas will go and run this high pressure turbine blade. And each blade is only about 3 inches long. And I tell you what that blade is made of. The heart of an air aircraft engine is only 3 inches long. And there are about 82 of them in a row like this, circular cross section. And so if I look at this, it is very important. Lot, lots and lots and tens of thousands of engineers have been responsible for enhancing this from just 400 degrees centigrade to about 800 degrees centigrade at this position. So that's why I showed you the rules of thumb in the previous slide. And then if you look at the turbine inlet, you remember I showed you this temperature and this temperature very important. If you look at the inlet temperature from 800 or 900 degrees centigrade, today we are talking about 1600 and 1700 degrees centigrade. How can you achieve such a temperature? If you look at the periodic table, there are few, very few structural materials which can withstand such high temperatures. As I told you earlier, it is only only because of surface engineering, because of having very high, um, uh, very efficient coatings. By, by coatings, I mean thermal barrier coatings, which can insulate the metal. So when we are feeling cold, what do we do? We put a blanket, right? We put a jacket or a blanket. 
and because there are air pockets in it, they insulate the cold from reaching the body, right? Very simple uh, heat transfer out there. Very similarly, we use porous coatings, A, which has a very low thermal conductivity. I'm going to later show you a slide here if I have a board, board where I can draw. The part C is by almost 500, 600 degrees. They're called thermal barrier coatings. They're there in all the aircraft today and really both with the single crystal, that small blade and the coating, that is how the engines are running today. And if you look at the, uh, and there are other legacies. So, what I'm going to show you in the next slide is, again, so if you look at the historically, we are looking at materials performance and we are looking at going from today where we are is this. This is the existing planes that we are flying, existing subsonic engine. Shortly, with all these materials and design enhancements, we are going to what is called the high-speed civilian transport. As I told you, from Bangalore to here, I can come in 30 seconds. Imagine how it will be, you know, this zoom and come off here. So, this is the cycle in a typical aero engine for which you will all be working and designing. When you start and take off, this is the cruising phase. So, the, you know, in the runway, it is taxiing, you know. After taxi, they will say it is going to lift off. <coughs> and that is called the climb. As you can see here, both in the blue colored and in the red color. When it is climbing, is where the turbine is exercising its maximum energy. So, that is why we dim off the lights. You remember, they say that switch off your uh, mobile phones or your laptops or blah, 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 all those things because all the energy of the aero engine or the turbine is spent here during the climb where the temperatures and the stresses are very high. After climbing, it is going to actually cruise at 30,000 feet to 35,000 feet. There it is reaching a steady state where you still have a long um, time at high temperatures. So we want to go from this regime today to this regime. How can we do that? As I keep saying, we have to innovate. We have to invent different possibilities of aero aerospace design mechanical design and metallurgical design to be able to go from here to here and again during landing. So just to give you an example taking the aero engine's history itself, if you replace this time temperature, temperature versus time clock for a rocket, how will this be? For a rocket, they are launching all these satellites, right, including Chandrayaan and uh, um, all these Mangalyan and all that you must have read. And India is very good at that. ISRO is there. We are very proud of the achievements of ISRO. So if I plot the same time and temperature history for a rocket, it will still be the same temperature out here or maybe a little bit higher. But the time, the whole thing will be finished in a few seconds. It just goes off, it has to reach the orbital velocity and then it has to go there. So remember, so the material that we are doing and the design we are doing for a rocket the higher temperature the material has to see only for a few seconds, tens of seconds. Then aircraft engine, it has to see it for tens of hours. Yes, I told you the longest flight now is the one from Delhi to Hong Kong, let's say in a green liner, where it can go for 22 hours without refueling, without stopping. Now if I extend the same thing and put it for a power generation plant, the gas turbine that runs power generation, like what we use, electricity, what do you think this chart will look like? This will be very, very long. But the temperatures may not be this high, maybe some like that. So it has to go for a few years. And if I say the same thing for a nuclear plant, you know, we are getting nuclear power. Kodan Pulan uh, recently they put the nuclear plant, and in uh, Kalpakam also we have two uh, nuclear uh, reactors. The same thing will go for decades. So when you see the, you know, the history, the cycle of history and the kind of material selection for mechanical design that we have to do, going all the way from, I'm talking of little niche, high temperature. If you take an automotive uh, cars and stuff like that, it is going to be much lower here. It's not with these high temperatures, including the internal combustion engine. So this just to give you a perspective of um, different materials. So here I want to show you <coughs> what was the enabler for these uh, very, very new kind of engines to come, which are able to take us in, uh, in the Boeing 777 and the Airbus A320. These, this is beautiful. So the fan blade originally was made of titanium alloy. Titanium has a density of, does anybody know the density of uh, titanium? What is the density of iron? We all studied in school, right? T is equal to mass by volume. Do you remember any? Okay, what is the density of water? 
What? Thousand what? Okay, two. Okay. There will be some other material density. I am. Yeah. Seven thousand. Seven thousand. Okay. I talk into the grams per cc, so I say eight grams per cc. You all agree with this? Seven to eight grams per cc. Um, so, what is the density of aluminum? Some, somebody from this side. You are also in aerospace, right? So why you also why? Why is only that side talking? Okay, girls, come on. Any any between is density. We are all good friends. Tell the wrong answer. There is no team. There is no ma. There is no ma. No, not not even one material is density. Okay, so titanium, so iron is about 7 to 8, nickel is about 7 to 8 grams per cc, because I mentioned hot and light, right? I've been talking only about hot, about temperatures. Um, titanium is about 4 grams per cc. I'm sorry, um, yeah, 4.2 grams per cc. What is aluminum? Since we are going decreasing down. We are going decreasing down, so I finished 4, it has to be lower than 4. 3.2 grams Not quite. I think the Sunday woman will have her chocolates too. Yeah, who said 0.8? Somebody, okay. It's about 2.7. Okay. So to, it's good to keep these numbers. They're all engineers, right? They're not just, uh, everything has to be out there. Then only the computer will do what. So, um, anyway, 2.7 grams per cc. And the structure, which is why the aircraft itself is made of aluminum. And today they're using composites, which have a density less than 1 gram per cc. So that you know, it can take off, uh, etc. So what I'm showing here is this is a carbon fiber reinforced composite, which is a beauty because it's not easy to make, and this has a density of 0.8 grams per cc. So today, this is what is sitting in your green line of brightness. Um, this is an old chart, but I'm going to tell you what are the different podcast part components. That is the, uh, that's the only thing of interest to us. So this is actually the compressor section. This is, as I told you, the combustor. This is schematic and this is the turbine section. If you look at the pressure versus the temperature graph, you can see the stress and the temperature reaching a high in the turbine section. Look at some of the numbers out here. I don't know if it means anything to you. Uh, a stress of 200 megapascals in a rotating component such as a blade. And you have temperatures between 11 and degrees centigrade. And as I said, this is little old. Today we are talking about temperatures of the order of 1600 degrees centigrade. Now what you need for a rotating blade rotates at high RPM even the fans rotating. I believe you have a force in your own college and unmanned vehicles. You have a master's force and all these fancy things. So it's very important for you to know what, what is stress, what is the strain that, uh, uh, that the uh, component is experiencing in order to make a design, mechanical design. So when you have this, a blade needs to have very high strength at the operating No use saying, I've made a nice nanocrystalline material which is very strong. And at the moment you put it, you blow hot air on it, it's going to weaken. So, important is strength at high temperatures. It means very good ductility. Why? What is ductility? Do you need to remember? No, I remember studying. Can yeah, tell me? Sorry? What is ductility? Thin sheets, the chairs, the planes is not the answer. Why don't you open up the stand up thing so that the others can? The stand up, others can hear me. So, what, is, what does it mean by uh, that kind of material? Malleability, ductility, and all we've learned. What does it mean? Please? So, what is the property? Is on a stress strain curve for an interview question. What is your manufacturing guy doing? That end point. Hey, make a chair for me. Hey, that's in that end point you'll tell us, is it? Come on. Okay. I'm trying to make it think more practical. What is okay, what is strength, you know, right? What is strength? Ability to withstand loads. What is the load bearing capacity without plastic deformation in the elastic? We also have between that and the UPS and an engineering stress strain curve. And then finally it nets and it breaks, right? Got four, I have to complain to your teachers. Okay, you can see me. Okay, I'm going to draw the stress strain curve. This is an engineering, this is the elastic limit. 
I have drawn the curve, which is the ultimate of that strength. Do you agree? Okay, what is ductility now? What? Oh. Well, one of you should say that. You're all mechanical engineers, right? And you finished first two years. What does it mean here? Yeah, what is okay, why does the Titanic say? All of you have seen the movie and we celebrate the 100th year and all that. Brittle, correct. Yeah, so opposite of brittle is that type. Do you agree? So what does it mean? Room temperature. You say, don't worry. Oh, you're talking about the Titanic. Okay, what happens? Exactly. So what is that thing? You said that. Underwater data is brittle transition. That is what it's called. So it went and hit that. It didn't break because it hit a silly iceberg. But cold temperatures became very brittle. And the maximum point at which the maximum stress at which any material uses plastic. That is not ductility. The maximum stress at which is the reason elastic limit. It's not loses its plasticity, it is gaining plasticity. No, not it loses plasticity. It becomes plastic. It is why we are able to make. Oh, it's not, uh, I am not teaching you undergraduate uh, proofs, but yeah. But it does break. Can you remember? You have formation. You all remember that? And then it. The ability of the material to escape without breaking, that is what is that reality? It has undergone plastic deformation, right? After this the material does do undergo plastic deformation. So a specimen like this, a specimen like this, ultimately becomes like this. We all agree? Do you remember this curve? Yeah? So this is, so from here, if this is L0 and this is L final, so this L, F minus L naught by L naught into 100 is the percentage of elongation. How much material elongating before fracture? Have you heard the word fracture? Is that anyone answering me? Okay, go back and uh, revise a little bit. So uh, what I want to say is, um, it means that imagine a bird Mike didn't like, uh, okay. When the plane is taking off, you know, you have a lot of birds and all that coming. Or any gas turbine in an automotive, anything happens, you'd rather have the material bend than break, right? Because you don't want breaks, then it is catastrophic. So you need very good strength, you need that to repeat the turbine bending Very high, uh, the high strength ductility. Then it needs very low thermal coefficient of expansion. You have all heard of CTE coefficient of thermal expansion. So you know when you when you heat something, it will expand. Metals have that unique property because these are very high temperature structures. You don't want to expanding and contracting every time the plane goes up and comes back. If it does that, thermal strains will be built into the material and it will undergo fracture. Third point. What is the fourth point? It needs very high uh, hot corrosion. What is hot corrosion? Corrosion at high temperatures. I mentioned this to you. So this is just to give you an idea of how mechanical engineers and aerospace engineers will use these parameters, will actually take the values which have been empirically determined, experimentally determined, and use it for designing a very complex material, such as the design I showed you before. Is this making sense? Make sort of sense? But the same material, if I take the disk, the disk is about this big, you know, the disc holds so many of these little blades. The disc is going to see a lower temperature. You know, a disc, a fan has a hub which holds the blades, right? So we spoke about the right to blades now. The blades are the heart of the engine. And then the discs are sitting out there holding the blades. The disc is going to see a lower temperature. It is seeing only about 760 degrees centigrade. But the stress it is going to see, because it is holding so many of the blades at 9 gram per cc, it is going to be having 
food stress because of the centrifugal force. So it, it needs a much higher strength requirement compared to the blades. So the blades are having high temperature, lower strength. The discs are having a higher uh, stress requirement and a lower temperature. So I mean, give a, look at these contradictions. How will I find different, different materials to suit these? And how will design actually incorporate these? So that is the whole beauty of being able to come and to look into each of the performance uh, for design and then design the component. So I go to the next slide. So this is an example of an inversive gas turbine. So taking off from there, so if you look at the compressors, typically they are all made of steel. So don't worry about all these numbers. They are all made of, in an inversive gas turbine, they are made of so many steels. There you don't mind weight. The, the buzzword there are cost and hot. Because you need to be cheap. When Tamil Nadu Electricity Board wants to generate uh, you know, power, when there is summer and there is load shedding, what will they do? They will put another turbine to actually run and uh, generate the power. So you have steels out here. What you have from this point onwards, all the way up to the end, you have various what are called nickel based supernovas. I am going to talk to you a little bit about nickel based supernovas because they, uh, they were invented in the 1950s and they are what are responsible for how today we are flying in air engines. That means we will sat back with Wright Brothers' invention itself. Just go to the next slide. So today we have. So two main workhouse alloys I should mention. Like, like people, uh, once you start working in the professional field, you will become very adapted to some of the professional things that you work with. So one of them is a nickel based alloy, the other is a titanium alloy. So this is what you see in, the, in, uh, in an aero engine as I told you. It is called Ti64, it is mainly used in compressors. It is titanium with 6% aluminum and 4 vanadium. You can see a temperature capability of 300 to 600 degrees centigrade. Okay? And if you go higher in temperature, you have these discs and these blades that you can see here I spoke to you about. These can see a temperature of about 11 degrees centigrade. And a very popular law is called Infernal 708. You can, you can maybe Google that and see it afterwards also. So you go to the next slide. This is, this is a little bit of detail, but it's very important for you to know. So make a note of it anytime you can refer to it later. I want to te take you through a little bit of the origin of the gas turbine materials. I spoke to you about two different materials, Ti64 and Inconel 7 and 8, right? So yeah, nickel base super alloy. So this is an old chart of the periodic table. But what I want to show you here is, when we're talking of mild steel or any steel, what are the ingredients of the steel? You have iron and carbon. You have only two of them. But that rust. So what do you add to the iron and carbon to make it without rusting? Hmm? Manganese without rusting? Nickel without rusting? Exactly. You all know that we use stainless steel. We call it stainless steel. No, we use cutlery at home. We use knives. So chromium was a, was a fantastic serendipity. In early 1913, there was a German scientist who actually left something, went for a vacation and he came back. He put some iron and things, he did some research and uh, <coughs> annoying addition. And he came back after a four day weekend and he found that it didn't rust. So he tried an experiment again, purposely adding a little bit of chromium to iron and carbon. And that is how in 1912, I think 1912 or 13, stainless steel came as a wonder, saying it's rustless. Because when you add you put a chromium to iron, it does not allow iron oxide to form. It forms chromium oxide on the surface, which is a very stable oxide, so we are able to pass. Stainless steel came to the picture. So we have iron, there is iron. Iron is out here, I have chromium out here, and what is our base material? Nickel. Now how did that start? So people wanted to melt um, a material. Happened that time, they needed to have heating elements in the furnaces. You know the things. You, you might have seen some, in school you might have done some coil heating, some simple experiments you would have done. So this heating element was actually made of nickel and chromium. Nickel and nichrome it is called, or it's called canthol, or you know, today you have super canthol and all that. So nickel and chromium is able to withstand very high temperatures in furnaces. So this German scientist said iron and chromium is able to give a rustless uh, iron which is stainless steel. So now we have now moved a little bit to the 1930s, 1935. People said, why don't we add a little bit of nickel and chromium to iron for the beautiful invention of Wright Brothers and start making blades out of that. So you've got nickel, chromium and iron and each of these elements has its own history. I'm not going to take you through that. 
because it's not a material sports. But beautifully, you can see today the modern blades that I showed you in the previous slide. You got the previous slide? Yeah. So the modern blades that we're talking about are actually made of 13 to 14 elements, each one indispensable. So in its own way. So when I first heard that as uh, a, when I just joined GD 16 years ago, I was actually really scared to step into a flight because it's so complex. You never know when an accident will take place and the whole plane will fall into the Bay of the Gulf, right? So if you go to the next slide. So this is what we call as a super alloy or a liquid based super alloy. If you count really there are 13, 12 to 13 different elements. But the main heart of the super alloy today is not chromium or iron or anything. The main heart of the super alloy is to have aluminum and nickel combined to form what is called the gamma prime phase. Okay, you may want to just remember that. It is an oscillated matrix. Oscillate you're familiar with, right? You studied the iron carbon diagram a little bit last year. So in an oscillated phase, you have these precipitates. It is like, I'll, I'll just quickly explain to you how the precipitates are able to impart a very high temperature strength. What do we want? What did we say two slides ago? You want strength at high temperature. You want ductility. What are the other two things I said? Hot corrosion and low thermal coefficient. Good. So what we need to design materials is how a lot of design took place. So you remember this German scientists, you will remember micron from the heating elements and slowly all the others which have not told you the uh, whole history. But the main claim to fame of the super alloys is, are these tiny precipitates. I'm going to show you. The, the size of the precipitate is the thickness of a strand of hair or even smaller than that. And what is the thickness of a strand of hair? Anybody? Less than one micro, maybe yours, mine is thicker. <laughs> okay, anybody else? Approximately. Good to keep numbers as I told you as, uh, as engineers. Yeah, it's about 100 microns, 40, 50 to 100 microns, okay? So um, so what we have, is these are the size of the precipitates, which means we can't see it with the naked eye. We need to use electron microscopes to see it. And why is it so, why, why these precipitates, we go to the next slide. Uh, why are these precipitates? See, can you see this? It's about 100. In fact, this is 100 nanometers. This is one, three orders of magnitude lower than the thickness of a strand of hair. So you can see these tiny precipitates out here in the nickel based metal. This is what is running your aircraft engine today. I'll give you an example of why these precipitates are very good for high strength and how. So, suppose in this room there is a fire and they announce, and we all want to run out. Okay? So, there is a lovely clear path for us from here. There is a door out here, so we can all go that side and go there. Let's say the exit is there. Supposing all these chairs were cluttered, it's not nicely arranged and there is no clear path out there. Then it will be that much more difficult for us to go out, right? We'll all be scrambling, climbing on the chairs, uh, bypassing, going around the chairs, and the time takes for us to get out by the time we probably the fire would have come and engulf the whole room. The very same, exactly the same phenomenon happens when you have these precipitation strengthened materials for high temperature strength. So this actually came into um, existence in the 1960s and it was a phenomenal uh, uh, discovery with the advent of electron microscopes which could actually image and see this kind, uh, this kind of resolution. You can't see it with the eye, you can't see it with an optical microscope. Why? Because the path taken for the material to plastically deform. And have you heard of the word dislocations? Have you heard of that terminology? Dislocations are like, you know, worms. So for the atom or the crystal to actually slide and shear and move, how does human being move? I move like this, no? I move my entire body like this to translate myself from one um, place to the other. Have you ever seen how an earthworm moves? You know, you move like this. It won't translate its entire body. And have you seen how a snake moves? Goes a little bit. But earthworm is exactly the way where incrementally it moves little pieces of its uh, body and it translates exact distance which we are all doing by taking our whole body there. So dislocations are exactly, previous um, slide, previous, yeah. So these are exactly, these precipitates are like the chairs which are arranged like this. If these precipitates were not there, the dislocation which is shown like this in the blue colored line will zip through and go and reach very, very fast. If you're putting obstacles to the dislocation movement, you're strengthening the material in, in, in effect because the time taken to go out of the room is much, much longer. Okay, I have to somewhat follow. So we have got the super alloy, we have got how it is strengthened. So if you can look at the size of the precipitate and the volume fraction, 
you can see the creep at uh, 900 degrees centigrade is much, much better. So from alloy chemistry, remember from performance in this, I'm just recapping very quickly, from perform performance in this, from design requirements, we have looked at what is the material chemistry, iron, stainless steel, nichrome, etc. From chemistry, we are looking at the structure. From structure, we look at the properties. Ultimately, we want the properties to be able to fly in the engine. Is that clear? So if you go to the next slide, this is a very busy slide, but I want to tell you how complex the structure is. If you just have iron and carbon itself, we have how many phases? We have an austenite, we have perlite, we have martensite, and then cementite. We have so many things, which is two elements. Whereas ice itself, if you just take water, when you ice itself is supposed to have so many allotropic forms. You have so many different crystal structures and so on. So with 13 or 14 elements, you are bound to have many, many microstructures. As I told you, the main claim to fame of today's engine, flying engine in terms of material requirement is the nickel and aluminum precipitate, whose picture I showed you, these tiny keyboard precipitates that are responsible for strengthening the material against creep, against fatigue, and you put up hot corrosion, corrosion as well. If you go to the next slide, um, if we go back, sorry. So I want to tell you from chemistry, we went to the microstructure, to the phases, and now we're going to the properties, and then we'll see the processing, and then I'll show you that. So what I'm going to show here is a little bit of detail, but what I want to give you a very quick example using this board.